Uh, I'm making a menorah. So. I didn't have money or time to go get one this year because, you know, being Jewish is expensive. And, well, I'm just using gold. My name's Nicholas Ryan Pake. Ephraim is my Jewish name. And um, I'm 18 years old. I'm from New Haven, Connecticut. And I now live in Wahlberg, North Carolina. I'm a gay Jewish Democrat. Drive. What is so important and what is my drive? Um, I would say laughter. It's, my motto is, um, it's not a good day until I've made someone laugh. And usually, you know, I make the bus driver laugh, so it starts off my day pretty well. Let's see. I, I feel most comedians, which is also one of my dreams, I have like 25, but you know, I, th I think that I'll get to all of them, at least at one point in my life. Um, but Joan Rivers, I look up to her immensely. Everyone thinks she's a bitch, but you know, I, I love her. Um, it was her first show after her husband killed himself. And, um, she went up there and everyone was quiet. Everyone knew what happened and everyone was like, how is this going to go? What's going on? And the first thing she did is looked at the audience and said, my husband killed himself. And she just went on with her show and made a joke and got the whole crowd laughing. Well, my dad's been married three times, so I have a half-sister, Ashley, and then I'm from the second marriage, let's go ahead and say that. There's me, Michaela, my twin, Tim and Jeff, my two older brothers. Then his third marriage we have, there's Brittany and Brett from the third marriage, but then like they aren't his kids, essentially. You know? They always say, oh, there's no difference, but, you know, it kind of is. Just, well, I mean, there is favoritism. They say there isn't, but it's, it's clear and obvious that there is. But, you know, I don't want to be in a place where, you know, I'm, I mean, even now I'm still trying and trying for approval. And it sucks because I know that I'll never get that approval from them. But, you know, I mean, so it's kind of like a love and care thing, you know. I'll, they'll never be able to give me the love that I so, I guess, desire, but, you know, I mean, it's just something that, you know, you learn to deal with. I knew I was gay. I was young. I was about fifth and sixth grade. I thought I was different. I thought I, you know, and then around the time seventh grade, I had the biggest crush on a guy named Jay Green. Yeah, he had abs. But anyway, that's not, <laughs> that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, and um, so I knew, and about seventh grade, um, you know, we had started going to church when I was in like the fourth grade. You know, I, I was never raised in a church. I never knew what, I never believed in God, even when I was baptized. Um, never believed in the whole Jesus thing. But you know, everyone else did, and I saw them having such a, they, they would call it a relationship, and they, they, they wanted the relationship. I had prayed and prayed. I, I remember nights specifically where I'd say, God, help me believe in you. Jesus, please come through, you know. And I'd pray that and pray that over and over again. 
I just, I just couldn't. And I couldn't, I couldn't ever figure out why. I just, I just couldn't. So I was trying and I, I convinced myself to believe in it. And you know, I, I went about, yeah, I'm a believer. I'm a believer because you know, everyone wanted me to be. Everyone thought it was, it was good. It was, it was a good thing to be a believer. Two, maybe two and a half years, it was about when I was 15, I looked at it for myself and said, I don't really believe in this. Um, so, this is uh, outside our patio, it's small. You know. This is the living room, the dining room, which is very occupied right now, very festive. Turn on that. Kitchen light doesn't work anymore. Light bulbs went out. So, um, yeah, this is the kitchen. Uh, there's no more cookies. We use it for, like, candies and stuff. I do a lot of cooking, um, and I can do more cooking now because, you know, we just went shopping yesterday. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, whenever we first moved in, I bought a whole, a uh, whole fucking set of, uh, blue. <laughs> Everything had to be blue, and I bought a bunch of, uh, blue bowls, plates, and stuff, so I can kind of sad. Um, and this is the bedroom, so yeah, this is where I sleep, and sometimes I sleep on the couch because I just end up falling asleep there or not. And uh, I have a roommate named Mason. He's a really nice guy. Um, yeah. All right, so the workplace, very open-minded, uh, very loving. Uh, everyone kind of doesn't give a shit. Uh, more or less, you know, it's just, it's, everyone is there for you, even if you don't like them, they're going to be there for you, and it's awesome. I get a ride by, um, people like you, and, uh, my brother sometimes, you know, he drives me whenever he's working, whenever we work together, so, you know, stuff like that, and, uh, uh, I'm changing outside because, well, this way I can walk in in my uniform already, and I can go in there as fast as I want to and clean it off because it's dirty. And also, this way the Mexicans, Mexicans can't see me. I'm a bus boy, I clean off tables, wipe them down, and scrape the dishes in the back, picking up buckets, and uh, running things for the bartender for the next five and a half hours. Uh, I'll be spending a lot of time with my mi amigo El Mayor Carlos. I love Nick. Like, he, he feels like kind of like a brother to me. Nick's a really close friend to me. I love him. We've done theater for together for a while. Individual. He is his own person. No one else, no one else has Nick's confidence to be who they truly are. Like, I'm completely envious of that. I would have loved to have been, to have been as confident with myself when I was his age. He is so sweet and he tries to be a little bit closer as friends rather than as a teacher-student relationship and so we have to make sure we keep those boundaries. Overall, he has a very positive attitude and he's just, he's ready to take the world by storm. To overcome like everything that he's gone through, I think he's very brave to do it, to move out and try to be on his own. He kind of reminded me of my family where like if something bad happens, we talk about it and then we'll cry about it and then we joke about it and we move on. And I think that's why I connect with Nick because he feels like family. Like I even invited him to my family for Thanksgiving because I know he would love them. And that's because he's so, I knew he would laugh the whole time. He just enjoys life. Like even when life tries to kick him down, he refuses to let it. I'm making dinner and uh, I'm making fried rice. So I'm gonna see how it goes. I used to do this at home a lot too. Uh, pennies, nickels, dimes, and then quarters. We have enough to wash clothes, not to dry them. <laughs> Laughter is important to everyone, and without it, I don't see much of life. You know, you like, I mean, of course there is one, but it's, it's dull. It's like cooking without spices. You know, because I know what it's like to be way down here. 
I know what it's like to feel imprisoned, but if I can for one second make someone laugh, my whole day has been worthwhile. It's been worth living. Again, Joan Rivers, after her husband killed himself, um, she wanted to make her daughter laugh. She hadn't seen her daughter smile in a long time. And so they went out to eat to a very nice place in Beverly Hills. And um, Joan looked at her daughter and said, you know, if your father saw these prices, he'd kill himself all over again. And that was the first time she saw her daughter smile in weeks. Well, he's a student of mine. And he's so sweet, even like during his lab time, when I'm doing stuff over here and trying to get some stuff ready for class, he is welcoming the kids that come in for art too, like he's, like he's the teacher. Mm -hmm. And he's, it's just, you can see himself light up when he's talking to the other students just to try to make their day or make them smile or make them happy. And that's wonderful that that's what's important to him, you know, when not many people think like that. So that's really sweet. School, um, school's fine, school is school, you know, I've been there four years, but um, I'm actually going to be going to GTCC to get my GED because that way I'll graduate faster. Right? I can work more. My reason for uh, dropping out and going to another school for a GED or high school diploma, I just feel at this moment that's fastest and then I can get my way on to working more and you know having more money to live off of. Um, which you know I don't, I, I'm making it and so I don't complain. You know I think it's fine. It's two classes a week. You go for a few, uh, for you know, a few hours and then you uh, they test you, and you gotta keep your shit straight. You got you gotta know what you're doing. I feel like now, you know, I moved out, you know, and I was prepared for it. You know, I I knew what I was getting myself into. But then, you know, you know now I'm going to Northwest still. You know, I'm having to wake up super early to get there. <laughs> when I work, I barely get sleep. So I feel like if I was to go to GTCC, it would just be better. And um, not only that, I can probably get into Leon's faster and graduate with my beauty license quicker than expected. And then I can be on my way to making money to support my dream whenever I go to UNCG to become a theater professor at Emerson College. That's the big idea. But I'm going there for my mas uh, up until my master's and then I want to transfer to Columbia, which I understand is an Ivy League school. So I love work. I do. And, you know, I, I appreciate it for what it is. A lot of kids, even my age and even people about, like older than me, they don't appreciate work for what it is. Uh, they complain about it. They bitch about it. You know, it's, it's, I hate whenever they do that because, you know, I'll, I'll even be at work and somebody who's been there for 10 years complains. And I'm like, okay, who signed the application? You or your mother. And it's, it's just stupid because, you know, it's a job. It gives you money. Why can't you just be glad? I mean, some people don't have one. You know, sometimes I know that I probably make only $7 a night, but I don't complain because I don't have anywhere else to go. So I stay. And plus, the people I work with are really supportive. If I'm short money for rent, I've had one girl give me $20. And she's like, here, pay me back whenever you can. I don't want it. You know, and so, you know, it's, it's just a good place. You know, there I'm accepted and everyone loves me. Uh, this is Gloria, Gloria Lynn. Um, I once auditioned uh, for a School Follies singing the last song on the album. Uh, no, it's the first one on side one. Uh, the Folks Who Live on the Hill. This one I searched for for two years, and I finally found it at um, Edward McKay's. This one I got at Golden Antiques. This one was Hippo. This was only a dollar, thank God. This one, oh my God, okay. So I feel for you. Uh, God, I can't remember what year. Maybe it was 86. And um, I feel like one day, one day I'm going to perform this on, on stage somewhere, like whenever I win a Grammy. And my all-time favorite, Tina Turner. Tina Turner I got uh, months before I got my record player. Months. And um, I, I, I was like, well, I'm gonna get one one day, so I thought I'd get it. It was only, it was eight dollars at Golden Antiques. And um, that Christmas, later on that year, I got a record player and a phone. I didn't give two shits about the phone. I op opened up the record player first and played this record. Um, 
At the time, it was the only one I had. I had Barbra Streisand for days. Barbara, Barbara, Barbara. My dad thought it would be funny to get me this one. Uh. <laughs> so I'm plugging in the Christmas tree. Um, my roommate and I put it up together. Um. And, uh, we decorated it a week ago. It's blue and white. You know, when I was a kid, I always prayed for a white Christmas when we got one this year. Which is funny. It's also the time we got my independence, so... You know, I guess it's symbolic in a way. But, you know, nonetheless, I've always celebrated Christmas and love Christmas, so... So I celebrate both. Burukata Adonai Lechunu Melech Holam Shechania No, Dad, say I don't even know how to pronounce this. The other night, you know, I was outside and, uh, you know, for a while, I had started to listen to what my parents had said, and I just thought less of myself. And um, I gained strength that night, you know, and I was looking up to God and just thanking Him because, you know, I'm here. Uh, it's been a road. I never expect life to be easy. I never have, even from the beginning. You know, you know, I always grew up, you know, thinking otherwise and then learning otherwise later so you know it's just like even with my mom you know her addiction that got got me here that's why I'm in North Carolina you know it's just everything happens for a reason but I'm glad that you know for Thanksgiving I was thankful for my voice because that's the one thing that no one can take away not only that it's just that I've made it I've made it on my own. You know, I, I, I always said that I can make it, I'm going to do it. And I finally have. And you know, I stood up for myself because I was no longer going to be victimized by someone who has a different mindset than I. I have to live life for me. And you know, I just can't... For instance, this light... They come once a year. But there's a time when they're out and a time when we take them out and light them up again. They resemble freedom and victory. Which is exactly what I'm celebrating. If I was still at home, I know I'd just be still doing the same thing. Trying to please someone and get someone's approval that I know I'll never get. But instead I'm here. I'm finally being independent and taking things for my own. And it, I'd be lying if I said it didn't hurt. Not having the family, you know, always near you, you know. Or being at home. Sometimes, you know, you'll miss it even if you didn't like it there. You do. But I just keep smiling. Do I think I could be doing better? Yeah. But I'm damn proud that I'm here. So I'm going to the family dollar, my favorite store. You have to pull them to order whatever clothes it goes. The leather stripper. That's it's a new one. Anyway. So I'm at the Family Dollar, and I'm about to get some yeast, the pie crust, and maybe some other things I've seen. Um, one, I'm getting the yeast so I can make sofkinyot, which is a Jewish donut, and uh, pie crust for a pumpkin. <laughs> three for three dollars. Fuck it. So one is one dollar. Alright, we're getting it.
Okay, so my, my running joke is I'm a gay Jewish Democrat, and I was living in a Republican fundamentalist Christian home. So it never worked out. I just don't believe that Jesus, I don't believe all the miracles that, you know, Jesus was born by the Virgin. Uh, okay, I'm not going into it, but you know, I just, I just couldn't believe it in myself. And it's good if you do, I won't judge you if you're Christian, Muslim, or Buddhist, you know, I just don't care. You know, I just want to find what was right for me. So when I celebrated my first Rosh Hashanah, it was beautiful. It was cheap, but it was, it was a day I'll never forget. I walked into the woods, I went deep into the woods and found my little river. And uh, I took bread and I would rip it up and throw it in the river as casting away our sins. And um, it was the Day of Atonement. And you know, that whole week God's writing books about you. And by the end, you want him to have a good book about you, you know. So um, I ca casted away all my sins. And that day I had an overwhelming sense of peace over me. And it was the best day of my life. I also started praying, Jesus, get this away from me. Why do, why do I keep doing this? Why, why do I keep looking at guys? You know, why, why, am, why am I so abnormal? You know, and I thought that I was, I thought that I was disgusting. I thought that I was wrong. I thought that I was going to hell because that's all they taught me in the church. I, I'm wrong. But by ninth grade, I came to accept it and I just kept it a secret. Um, 10th grade, I told my best friend, and then I told Miss Gray, the art teacher. She was, I think, the fifth person I had told. Let's try to bring the viewer's eye into that vehicle. So we'll give this a little bit more. I would say he's a vibrant old soul. I always tell him he's such an old soul. And he's, that would be my one thing. I would say he's such a vibrant old soul because he just, when he walks into the room, you can just see there's a, always, always a glow around him, but he's so, he's so thoughtful, and he's he's so artistic in the sense of where he pays attention to to little minuscule details of things. I think most people would like to have the attitude that he has, you know, especially with everything that he's going through. He still majority of the days has a smile on his face, and he, and the funny thing is is that. He's going through so much himself, but then he doesn't think about himself, and he thinks about how to make other people happy. And that's just a wonderful character trait in someone, especially for a high school student. That's why I told him he has an old soul, because I said, you're a 50-year-old and a 17-year-old's body. <laughs> so this is my closet. It is a mess, but this is where the fabulous happens. So, um... We have short sleeve, long sleeve, button ups, button downs, you know, you got it all. Um, we have collared shirts over here. Well, they're everywhere, but you know what I'm saying. And then I have my dress pants, like the fancy pants that I have actually gotten too big of me. I've lost weight. So when you first walk in, you know, everyone, you know, oh, can I take your coat? And I'll put it in the closet. I have all 12 of my sports coats. I have the chorus chucks. I have green. Um, I've had people say, Dude, you're gay? Like it was some disease. Like, you know, like, and it's, I wouldn't choose that when I could be normal. You know, I would rather choose an easier life. But see, even this, it also hits the family. It hits home, you know? And so I wasn't going to be victimized. I wasn't going to be told that I was disgusting, that I was wrong, that I was defiling the house of God. Because the same thing happened to blacks, to women, you know, and that's why I realized this um, a, few, a while ago. I've never really liked pride, gay pride, you know, like you have the parades, you have this, that. I hated it because I'm like, can't you just, you know, let it be, we're gay, just, just, just relax, come on. But I realized we have it because everything we've had to go through to be ourselves in society today. Just like women, everything they've had to go to to be able to vote, to, to do what they want to do too. And blacks, for them to get their rights. So we're just trying to get our rights, which is why we celebrate. Women have Women's Day, and, and so do blacks. Black History Month. You know, I never really liked Black History Month, but I understand why they have it, because everything I've been through. So what I'm saying is if you feel imprisoned in your own home, if you feel you can't be yourself in your own home and you feel like it's not okay 
find someone and talk to them. Because you have to live life making your own decision. You can't let others get to you. Because I've done a lot of listening and I'd fall into it. Countless times I've fallen into it. I've listened and I believed it. I at one point believed I was wrong and disgusting. That I was nothing. I at one point thought that I wouldn't make it. At times I'd find comfort in the things that I shouldn't have. I'd, I'd grab out a knife and I'd sleep with it. It was comforting. I didn't know what to do for the longest time. Even at home, I'd have to run to the attic. I'd cry at least two, three times a week. I felt caged. But it gets better. But you have to use your voice. You have to stand up. Even if it's to your loved ones. Yes, I've been through hell and back with my family because of what they believe. I'd still take a bullet for them. Why? I can't even figure that out. But you have to stand up. You have to be yourself. Because at the end of the day, if you're not letting yourself be who you are, that's a damn waste of your day. And you're caging yourself. I've been there. Ms. Kaufman, my theater teacher, said, you know, I'm glad you found yourself. You know, sophomore year, you were a hot mess. But please, listen to yourself. Find your peace. And be the person you are, no matter what your religion thinks, because you, over time, will find that everything you think will change. Foil for all he needs, a bed and 